actually touched on this a little bit, and I'll, I'll start there while questions are, are coming up. Um, can you talk a little bit more about sequencing? Um, what what do we what are we beginning to hear? What are we um, anecdotally about the order of treatments, number of doses, and so on? Yeah, I think that we, we don't know nearly as much as we'd like to at this point. Uh, the most the most important uh, fact that we do know is that. If you start with one medicine and don't have a successful response, um, you can still respond to the other medicine, and that works in both directions. We've all heard about patients who have started with anti-PD-1, maybe responded for a while, and then had a recurrence, or maybe perhaps never um, um, responded at all, um, and then had a very nice response to ipilimumab and vice versa. We've heard of patients who have had disease progression after ipilimumab um, and then had beautiful responses to anti-PD-1. Whether there is an advantage to one sequence or, or the other is unknown. That's, that's the subject of some clinical trials right now. And on the subject of um, brain mets and other difficult disease, what, what is the science telling us about that? Um, uh, and assuming we tackle brain mets and are successful with immunotherapy, what will be the next frontier for difficult disease and melanoma? So um, I'll be interested to hear what, what Dr. Topalian says, but brain metastases are, are a particular challenge for mm -hmm. a few reasons, but we do know that um, there was a clinical trial that was uh, led by uh, Dr. Kim Margolin uh, looking at ipilimumab in patients with brain metastases, which showed actually that there can be durable responses with ipilimumab even in patients with brain metastases. What was important is that that trial had two cohorts. One were patients who were chronically needing um, steroids like Decadron to control their symptoms, and one cohort where the patients didn't need Decadron. The group that didn't need Decadron were the ones who benefited. And so that's a, a very important part of uh, the challenge in brain metastases that the symptoms um, are controlled by immune suppressive medicines and those can interfere with the activity um, when they're used up front of, of immunotherapy. Uh, Dr. Harriet Kluger at Yale is currently doing a trial of pembrolizumab in patients with uh, melanoma brain metastases. So hopefully we will learn uh, a little bit more about what the activity of PD-1 blockade is in that setting. <laughs> Do you know anything? Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add. Okay. Um, there are a number of questions that relate to the, um, the label that Keytruda was awarded when, in its recent approval by the FDA, that is for patients who have received prior ipilimumab and or ABRAF inhibitor if eligible. Um, can you comment on that and um, what, uh, what we should all be hoping for? Well, that, you know, that approval was based on very early clinical trial information. And so, uh, of course, we're, we're hoping to see approvals soon in the first-line setting. And we know that the drugs can be effective in melanoma in the first-line setting. I mean, the information is out there. But most of this information is, is from early clinical trials, and the landscape is evolving very rapidly. Um, the phase three trials are ongoing now with several hundreds or thousands of patients, and I think uh, we'll all have more confidence when we see the results of those trials in, in how these drugs should be used. Yeah, I, I think uh, right now the drugs, I mean, pembrolizumab was approved based upon the, um, the particular set of data that was submitted from the phase one trial. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's any um, scientific or medical rationale for why someone would need to receive ipilimumab or a BRAF inhibitor beforehand, but um, you know, at, at, at our institution, I'm sure at Johns Hopkins as well, we, we have to follow the label um, right now because otherwise that's actually considered insurance fraud. Um, and I don't think you'd like to see either of us in jail. Uh, you know, or orange is not the new black for me. So um, I, 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 I think that one thing that is also true is that there is not a number of doses of ipilimumab that is specified in, in the approval. So um, I think patients and physicians can talk about that, whether you need to receive all four doses of ipilimumab or whether perhaps just one or two, repeat a scan, see how things are going. That's uh, an individual discussion. Mm -hmm. 
And um, on the subject of being flexible with regards to treatment with therapy, what about uh, combinations um, and how patients kind of align their care and discussions with their doctors? What I'm trying to get at is, um, is there a strategy patients should be thinking about for the future in the, um, well, if 88% holds true or 80% holds true, then it may be less of a consideration, but should patients be considering a strategy in their conversations with their doctors of, all right, if we go with this one first and this one second, then if something goes wrong, I'll be set up for the next trial with might be oncolytic virus therapy or something? I think it's hard to know. Um, in, in, all, in all honesty, I think that we, I, I try to make decisions with my patients that reflect what's available to us now, uh, what trials are available now, because sometimes if we try to think too far into the future about what might or might not be happening, um, clinical trials that we think would be um, terrific opportunities sometimes don't transpire in the time frame. That, uh, that we want. So we make the best decisions we can together based upon the information available at that moment. Yeah, clinical trials are still a primary option for patients with stage four uh, melanoma. And I think uh, rather than trying to piece together an individualized therapy, because this is the, uh, you know, maybe the first thought that people have because they heard about something dramatic that happened in a, on a trial or whatever, um, really, I think the, the best uh, path is uh, uh, to enroll on clinical trials. If you, if you are one of those people who wants to be part of um, a groundbreaking effort to move the ball, to, adva to advance uh, knowledge further. I mean, that's how we have gotten to the point that we are today, is by people enrolling on clinical trials. Um, uh, I have a couple questions here related to side effects. Um, one related to sort of long-term side effects, or what I tend to think of as long-term sequelae of immunotherapeutic treatment, and the other specifically uh, vitiligo, and vitiligo in the context of treating other diseases, not melanoma. Is, it, is that seen in those kinds of settings as well? Um, and then on the long-term consequences of immunotherapeutic. Mm -hmm. So vitiligo is, has only been seen in the melanoma patients, and we've seen this going back, you know, 25 years when we were developing interleukin with the adoptive cell transfer therapies and, and so forth. There's always a, um, a small uh, group of, of patients um, who develop vitiligo. Sometimes we even see it in patients uh, receiving chemotherapy like DTIC or temozolomide. Um, and it, it usually, uh, you know, is, is a, a promising uh, sign for us because many of those people do res respond to whatever uh, the treatment that, that they're on. But the fact that we don't see it in lung cancer and kidney cancer means that it really is a hallmark of a specific immune response against the tumor, against melanoma, that is all also spilling over to destruction of normal pigmented cells, melanocytes is what they're called. Is there, um, is there any evidence that a vaccine or a local therapy of some sort can, um, can goose up the immune system for a, a non-responding lesion where there are responses in other lesions in the patient? I, I think it's possible if we think about that radiation um, effect that, um, that I showed you. But what we do in the context of single lesions or, or one or two lesions that are not responding um, when the global picture is improving is we, we often go back to uh, very conventional thinking in oncology and we even uh, speak to our surgical colleagues about removing those so-called breakthrough or escape lesions. Um, and I've certainly had people who've had single lesions removed surgically after ipilimumab and they've gone on to do well in the very long term. Um, some, or they could be injected or irradiated. Um, so I think that there, there are a long list of ways to try to address these so-called breakthrough lesions. And I think one of the sort of secondary gains of um, these medicines, the CTLA-4 and PD-1 blocking medicines, is that even if they don't allow for the elimination of all the disease, if they just slow the pace down enough for you to be creative, um, and use surgery or radiation um, to control um, isolated areas of recurrence, that's um, a very good benefit because it 
uh, is something that in the context of the disease more globally getting worse, you never would have been able to do that. I mean, Dr. Topalian, of course, is a surgical oncologist, and she would probably agree with me that someone who had, you know, 25 metastases progressing all at once, that wouldn't be an op optimal surgical scenario. But someone who had 24 of those uh, metastases that stopped growing, but one that continued to, you know, march to the proverbial beat of a different drummer might be something that would be worth removing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Suzanne, could you talk a little bit about um, melanoma subtypes, not um, sun-exposed melanoma, and what the role of immunotherapy is for those types, uh, for example, acral, mucosal, mm -hmm. ocular? Yeah. So, um, about 50% of melanomas, that's a really rough uh, estimate, but let's say about 50% are related to sun exposure and the others are not. The others are related to uh, mutations, genetic accidents, which um, can be uh, random but uh, can create a scenario that drives the formation and the progression of cancer. Um, we have found that immunotherapy can be effective in sun-exposed or non-exposed melanomas. Um, and I don't think it's been looked at in a formal way. Now, uh, whether the sun-exposed, which um, are believed to have more mutations, whether they may be more responsive. So that is, that is the subject of ongoing research. From what um, you've heard uh, from several speakers today, it may, it may be so that the, the tumors that have the, the largest numbers of mutations are going to be most susceptible to immunotherapy, again, because these mutations create new proteins that can be targets for immune attack. So it's what we call a testable question, and it's something that is being looked at in the laboratory now. I but yeah, yeah, I think actually uh, Dr. Jason Luke, who uh, worked with us and now is at the University of Chicago, actually had some recent publications uh, around this area of um, the response to immunotherapy and melanoma of these rare sort of non-sun-related um, uh, subtypes. So um, I think you've got a, a real expert in, in the room here. And if I could summarize his elegant work, is that these medicines can work uh, even in these non-sun-related subtypes, but perhaps at a lower frequency. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> um, on the subject of, uh, we've talked a lot about checkpoint blockade, and which is really very promising, obviously, given the two approvals for um, anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 antibodies. Um, in the um, category of other immunotherapies, you presented adoptive cell therapies, vaccines. Um, there's, of course, oncolytic viral therapy is on the horizon. Um, what, is there anything else that, that we ought to be thinking about, stem cell therapy, um, anything of that nature that, that folks have in mind? Or is it fair to consider adoptive cell therapy as a kind of stem cell therapy? Uh, I wouldn't consider it a stem cell therapy because they're, they're not self-perpetuating cells unless you endow them with those properties by putting certain genes into them. But um, we're cutting a, a fairly wide uh, swath here already. And if you add the interleukins, which are still in play, so there are newer interleukins like IL-15, IL-21, et cetera. Um, and then you think about all the possible combinations of those drugs. I, I think we really have our work cut out for mm -hmm. us. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an important point, that we focused a lot about these, um, of this, these talks on the molecular breaks of, um, you know, the, the, the inhibitory checkpoints. But there are also uh, a lot of activation points that can be further accelerated, if you will. And so there are several medicines in clinical development um, that are in clinical trials right now, medicines that augment the CD137 pathway, that augment the OX40 pathway, that augment another pathway called the Gitter uh, pathway. These are all sort of accelerator points. And there are now antibodies and also other uh, proteins that cause those accelerators to be pushed down a little bit harder. Um, those are, as you kind of survey the, the clinical trial literature, those are um, more complex trials to do because the experience thus far with agents like that is that they can be quite dangerous, even at low doses. There have been deaths due to some of these drugs given by themselves at, at remarkably modest doses. And so if you get into a study that you know, randomizes you or has you go into a, a, a group that has a vanishingly low dose, that may be perfectly appropriate 
for one of these step on the gas drugs because um, you might only need a small amount uh, as opposed to the amount of medicine that you would need to block one of the breaking mechanisms. So just to wrap up, I really just want to say thanks to all of you for your attention um, and for participating in this session. I think what you've heard is that there, uh, we are living in a time of incredible progress, that these accomplishments that are coming out right now that are benefiting patients in melanoma and many other cancers um, day by day based on the results that are coming out have arisen because of research. Uh, some of that research being done in the lab, some of that research being done in the clinic, and some of it being done uh, bi-directionally with communication apart um, across both of those domains. So it's incredibly important to support that research in whatever way you can, <coughs> whether it's being in a trial or whether it's um, supporting your, your local center or your favorite foundation. So just really uh, thank you for your attention, and I want to thank our speakers for today's session. Thank you.